This is best friend of the show, Monica Cabina, artist and colorist on Batman The Adventures Continue. Hey, this is Jordan Gibson, artist of Batman The Adventures Continue. And you're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam. Streaming at DCAUReview.com and on your favorite podcast app. Welcome, everyone, to a special bonus episode of the DCAU Review. I am Liam, and with me, as he always is, is Cal. Cal, uh, we don't have to talk about specifics, but uh, we got some some real-life stuff is kind of uh, cutting into our Mm -hmm. prep and recording time these next couple of weeks, but we didn't want to leave our listeners hanging with no new audio. So we decided for this week and next weekend, we're going to provide a couple of... uh, couple of comic book reviews and we're going to get into a little bit of the history of an episode or a movie that almost was and uh, we're kicking it off here with the first issue of one of the classic dcau tie-in comic books that's right yeah we um now that we've wrapped all 85 episodes of the original batman the animated series run um we'll have a little bit of time before we jump right into the new batman adventures so in the meantime we have some of this stuff that was as we've talked about before uh while the canonicity if that's the word you're looking for is (laughs) certainly in question at times um i would say arguably though a lot of these comics or some of these tie-in comics were as big a part of our childhood and enjoyment of the Batman, the animated series DCAU uh, as the cartoons themselves, just for uh, readability, availability, stuff like that. Uh, when we were growing up, um, you know, it this we were almost, I would say, more often than not reading the comics than <laughs> than watching the the cartoons. Just we didn't have the full series on, you know, available to watch whenever right. we to um you know we had restrictions as kids on when we were allowed to watch tv and how much tv <laughs> we could watch per week so there were uh there were things in place that kind of made us fall in love with a lot of these comic books and excited to talk about uh, as you alluded to a uh, an interesting one here that we have to get to and that is the batman and robin adventures volume one issue number one we'll be covering issue number one this week and it is the rare comic book two-parter. Um, oh, yeah. I say I say rare co- comic book two-parter. I guess that's pretty common in comics, but yes. as far as DCAU comics, that wasn't always the uh, the case. They were usually True. pretty much self-contained. So this one is a two-parter, and uh, as you mentioned, plays off of uh, some of the the stories that uh, were absolutely canon in the DCAU, and specifically Batman the animated series. An important one, one we talked about on last week's episode when we were recapping. Our uh, our entire coverage of the 85 episodes, uh, that being Two-Face. So we have an interesting one today. It is Two-Timer. And as you alluded to, Liam, this is an interesting one because, uh, yeah, it, there is certainly um, a backstory to this that leads it to be more than just the premiere issue of this Adventures in ba- uh, uh, or Batman and Robin Adventures comic book run. You're absolutely right. And by the way, I'm just going to apologize now because I'm going to screw up the name of this comic book series a hundred times because it's too similar to (laughs) the show was called Adventures of Batman and Robin and this comic is called Batman and Robin Adventures. So I'm going to just mess that up constantly. So this is your this is your forewarning for the listeners. But yes, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the the two part story that we'll be talking about over the next couple of weeks was uh, nearly, according to Paul Dini and a few of the other people who worked on the series, uh, this at least an outline of this story was uh, in the running for what ended up being the first major motion picture produced by the Batman, the animated series team. Of course, the legendary Mask of the Phantasm, which we've covered several times on this uh, on this show. So definitely go back in the archives if you want to hear us talk about that and that movie's comic book sequel. But uh, yeah, this was one of the other ideas in the running. It is, uh, as we'll get to here, a a script written by Paul Dini, who, of course, was one of the head writers and producers on the original animated series, responsible for some of the greatest episodes of the uh, maybe some of the best Batman stories ever written full stop. So uh, this is uh, this is an interesting one. He's also collaborating with Ty Templeton as the penciler and Rick Burchett as the inker to longtime uh, DCAU tie in comic artists. And uh, we have Linda Medley as uh, the colorist, Richard Starkings at uh, lettering. And we have uh, Darren Vincenzo and Scott Peterson as our editors. So. Yeah, this was uh, this could have been an on-screen adventure, and that's interesting because as we'll get to, 
this very much works both as a direct sequel to the original Two-Face two-parter, as you mentioned, picks up with uh, several characters, both his friendship with Bruce Wayne, as well as his uh, his sort of lost love uh, in Grace, who was, of course, his fiance until he became the Two-Face. And uh, I guess the interesting part, and we'll maybe, we'll, maybe we'll make our final ruling at the next week once we've uh, read the full, uh, the full two issues, but uh, does this take place? I'd like to know what people think. Uh, if, if Let's assume it's canon, just for fun. Sure. Uh, uh, does this take place before or after Second Chance? Because at the end of Second Chance, it sort of ends on a bit of a hopeful note that maybe Harvey's uh, getting back on the right track, even though he does relapse in that episode as well. But then this one sort of makes a more declarative statement that he's not, <laughs> he's not getting better. <laughs> He's off the wagon <laughs> at, or at the very least that both Batman and uh, and perhaps Grace. We'll get to that next week. have be- begun to lose lose faith that the real Harvey is still in there. So I'd love to know what people think if uh, if this fits uh, again, assuming assuming it's canonicity. Uh, what uh, what do people think if this is this if this is between two face and second chance? Is this after second chance? And this is actually the bridge for as people have kind of pointed out and complained why Two-Face is just kind of back to being a gangster in the new Batman adventures. That's another mm-hmm. part of it. I think that yeah. is interesting because he, the way that ending is, it kind of makes more sense why Batman's a little colder to him in the new Batman adventures. So we're going to get to all of that and discuss it. And then I guess the, the, the question, the other question to throw out is knowing these two comic stories as they are, and they are fun issues do we think maybe this is another ruling we'll have to make after we finish the the part two uh would we give up i think i think it's safe to say none of us would trade in uh, mask of the phantasm for anything mm-hmm. but say would this have been a better story than sub-zero that's that's i think maybe another action item question that we can we can throw out once we get into it but yes as you mentioned cal let's get into a, a little bit of a plot recap here with two timer part one uh, we open with Batman and Robin uh, beating up some thugs, taking care of some kind of heist on the docks. Uh, very dramatic. And uh, as they're breaking off from the evening after after taking care of the thugs, Batman mentions that he's got an early appointment in the morning, that he's heading to Arkham to visit his old friend. And we head right to Arkham Asylum, where we see Bruce Wayne and Grace, Harvey's former love, uh, here uh just sort of taking uh, taking part in a therapy session with him, uh, offering their support that they they hope that he is getting better. Harvey mentions that he's being uh, he's more able to make decisions without the coin, which is a which is seen as a big breakthrough for him. And uh, it seems like uh, it's a real hopeful note to open on. But uh, you know that darn clown is always lurking in the background, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting one too because uh, as you mentioned. If uh, the interviews from uh, from Paul Dini around writing this, uh, there's several different tidbits where he talks about how uh, this was certainly in the running or an idea for a a movie um, at times. Um, You can see here. It's interesting that it sort of follows the similar path that mask of the phantasm did where you use the Joker in the movie or in the in the script, but he's very much a supporting character versus the main the main antagonist um so hmm. i i like that idea i like that you bring in somebody that would obviously you could use if this was a movie you put the joker on a poster you put him in trailers mm-hmm. and uh people are certainly all excited about it but in actuality you write a a di- di- very different type of stories we get into here, but yes, the Joker is standing by watching all the goings on in Arkham as he sees Bruce and Grace leaving Two Face, and uh, he's just bored out of his mind clearly, and decides uh, why not mess with old Harv. So uh, he begins sowing some seeds of doubt in, in uh, into Harvey's brain about Bruce's true motives for why he's quote unquote helping Bruce. Uh, Two Face initially has. Wants nothing to uh, to do with the Joker's uh, uh, conspiracy theories that are leading him to believe that this is uh, 
Two-Face initially wants nothing to do with the Joker's conspiracy theories that uh, that he's throwing out there and clearly sees him riling him up. But he does appear to at least somewhat get under Two-Face's skin initially uh, as he's saying that uh, maybe Bruce is not interested in having Harvey cured, but really uh, he's just looking for him to keep keep him locked away so that uh, he can make the moves on grace in a not so subtle, (laughs) subtle way of saying it. (laughs) Uh, We then cut to a scene with Bruce and the aforementioned grace as they're kind of discussing their latest session with Harvey. Uh, Grace is certainly being very open and vulnerable with Bruce about uh, the, her feelings about Harvey and how at times she's lost hope. Bruce is continuing to give her encouragement. He also unveils from standing on this giant clock tower. He unveils this plan for these new Gotham gardens where he's opening up retail and also uh, some government subsidized housing and some other uh, low income housing specifically. And uh, they're certainly having a moment here. And I guess this is something that certainly is interesting about it is that either Bruce is completely oblivious to like, this woman's clear vulnerable state here where she is certainly having doubts and concerns about her fiance or her ex fiance at this point and whether or not he will ever be truly mentally well. Um, They certainly share a moment talking about uh, reminiscing about their time at the half moon club, which of (laughs) course was a part of second chance and mentioned in second chance. Uh, but they mention uh, how Harvey and her and Bruce and anyone else, uh, whoever Bruce was dating at that time, uh, no particular woman's name could be remembered. <laughs> Grace said, because there were so many of them, uh, they would all dance together at the half moon club. But uh, she's certainly attempting to open up a little bit and, uh, she shares the, her, her feelings about this. And Bruce just kind of encourages to, stay the course that things are going to get better. And uh, she mentions that Harvey's good, uh, lucky to have a great friend like Bruce. We cut back to the Arkham Asylum where the Joker is still uh, up to his old tricks. Once again, needling and continuing to, uh, to try and get under Harvey's skin. Uh, He initially apologizes and said that, uh, well, he was out of line, but then uh, he just essentially continues down a different pathway saying that, uh, you know, in in actuality, Bruce is absolutely still interested in keeping Harvey locked up so that he can move in on uh, on Harvey's girl and uh, and get the best of him. So we see see him uh, run away from Two-Face before Two-Face can get his hands on him. Two-Face reads a headline noting that Bruce is uh, is at has some sort of event that evening and is going to be uh, going to be very interested in that. Uh, Joker was also reading that newspaper. So he runs off, steals a phone and makes a phone call to someone as we (laughs) cut to the actual evening where Bruce and Dick uh, with a lot of other socialites are there talking. Grace shows up to the party. Bruce invited her to that. That's the part where I'm like, Come on, Bruce, like you got to be you got to be more aware of this. Like, I I know he's not aware of the whole Joker trying to get under Harvey's skin thing of like optics. But still, like she's very vulnerable. She's having these doubts. And you're like, hey, come out and essentially (laughs) be my date to this Mm -hmm. event. (laughs) Well, also, even even assuming Bruce's good, good intentions, uh, like he's he's a world famous person and he's bringing a woman like a single woman mm-hmm. uh, you know that's going to be on his arm and then he's slow dancing with so even if what doesn't happen or even if what does happen doesn't like probably somebody would have seen them together at some point and snapped a picture like he's a he's a pretty famous guy in this town right but, yeah uh, that's that's the part where I I just I'm just like he's He's the most and he's the world's greatest detective. And he couldn't figure out that optics for this for his best friend's ex fiance that is still interested in at least by her words is interested in staying with Harvey and that this wouldn't be a bad situation for the two of them or a potential tempting situation for either of them. Just not a good optics, but well, the dialogue very much suggests that grace has thought about it (laughs) right right yeah she's she's very clear that uh, you know in another life 
Um, this is where the conversation happens where they're recounting their time at the half moon club. But Mm -hmm. as they're slow dancing together, she's talking about how, you know, um, you know, in another life, they could, you know, she could have perhaps been interested in him. And, um, you know, his loyalty to Harvey is certainly attractive. And it's, yeah, it's very clear um, that there's at least some interest there from Grace's turn. And some of it may be, again, the vulnerability of this traumatic experience that she has just been in. But regardless, Bruce certainly put her put themselves put the both of them in a position that was not was not the best. And we see uh, at this point, Liam, we get the reveal of just who it was on the other end of that phone, that (laughs) phone call that the Joker made uh, with the stolen phone in Arkham Asylum. That's right. It's a it's another blonde woman in in red. And uh, yeah, it's Harley who snaps a picture of Grace giving uh, giving Bruce a little peck on the cheek and uh, tries to excuse herself, though both Bruce and Dick hear her speaking, and uh, safe to say she doesn't have any. She doesn't have the ability to change her voice, I guess. So that <laughs> that tips Bruce and Dick off that something's going on. They they make a they make their way away to uh, try to suit up. In the meantime, however, Harley makes it uh, makes it around uh, the party and finds the society e- editor for the Golden Globe, and prints off that Polaroid of uh, of Grace giving Bruce a, a kiss, and uh, tells the reporter they just announced their engagement, which apparently, as we find out later, the reporter just prints <laughs> without asking Bruce Wayne if that's true. I guess. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, at that point, Harley is confronted by the dynamic duo. They have a little bit of a fight, including uh, Harley uh, hitting them with a flamethrower locked inside a camera, which and a, and a, and a uh, machine gun inside a video camera or a camcorder. Uh, they're eventually able to uh, subdue her. But then, of course, she sticks the hyenas on them. They're eventually able to subdue the hyenas, but not before Harley gets away. And uh, so the next day at Arkham, we see Joker grabbing a copy of the newspaper. And uh, after he uh, he reads the headline and likes what he sees, he slides it under uh, under the door of Har- Harvey's cell, at which point he sees that society page uh, implying, in fact, that Bruce is going to marry Grace. And we see uh, Two-Face tear the paper apart in rage. And uh, right then and there, the orderly and the guard are bringing him his breakfast and uh, in a fit of rage, he overpowers them both and escapes quickly. And uh, it's uh, it's two faces back. He's back on the run. Batman and Robin investigate at Arkham with Commissioner Gordon. And at which point they find out that uh, that, of course, that the Joker was involved and that he pushed him over the edge. And it may be one of the, you know, non non televised quintessential Paul Dini Joker lines. He informs Batman that he did all of this to Two Face to Harvey because it was Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so that uh, yeah, so that uh, that's that's a pretty good Joker. He just he just wanted to screw with him, so he did. Yeah. Uh, so as uh, as Batman and Robin are leaving, they discuss uh, what could what could be happening here. And uh, Batman mentions that the Globe will be printing a retraction on the phony story but that it's likely too late and that Harvey is out there somewhere angry and believes he's been betrayed by his two best friends and uh, things are going to get better or things are going to get bad before they get better. And uh, we, we see that illustrated as uh, as grace. Here's a knock. Here's some gunshots A foot comes crashing through her front door. And we see two face brandishing a couple of pistols and uh, he tells her that it looks like she, like he's not the only two face in Gotham anymore, and that's our cliffhanger for issue number one here of uh, Batman and Robin Adventures. Um, man, it's first issue. That's a there's a lot going on because one, as we talked about, it picks up on threads from previous episodes. It maybe puts in some stuff. Well, obviously, it does directly follow up in the next issue, but. Uh, the Joker cameo, like there's a lot packed into this and it's all kind of setting up the this sort of bombastic resolution. But it is interesting, I think, because I think the the some of the best episodes of the series were these two face episodes where Batman is, you know, so conflicted because Harvey is was his best friend and he so wants to believe that he could be again. And so there's like an extra little bit of a twisted knife every time. 
Two Face comes back, it's it's a little bit harder for for Batman to deal with, and so the 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 sort of descent that we see Harvey go on throughout this uh, throughout this issue, it's it really it really does feel like you're pressing back on the metal spring, and you're like, oh, it's gonna it's gonna come flying any second now, and we we see that by the issue's end here. Yeah, it's um, it's it's shaking up a bottle of soda and then trying to twist off the cap. It's, you know, whatever, whatever uh, allegory you want to use for it. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's certainly an interesting one to ramp up here for the inaugural issue of this series, too, where you have a cliffhanger. Um, you have the Joker, you have Harley, you have Two-Face, and you have enough familiar storytelling and characters here that really make this feel like a um, a piece of continuity. As we talked about, it certainly mm-hmm. doesn't contradict any continuity that I'm aware of. Um, so it is interesting that we we get that right off the bat. And it it does have a lot of tension in it. As we mentioned, there's certainly a lot of question marks at the end of the uh, by the end of the issue as to, you know, what Two-Face is going to do with breaking in. Uh, and now that he's found Grace, um, how Batman and Robin are going to go about trying to find him. Um, that's actually how we we kick off our next issue. So it's uh, it's certainly uh, a, a good start here, I would say. I think there's enough here if we were we were judging it by uh, the some of uh, the a lot of the other ways that we've reviewed comic books on on the show here on bonus episodes where we've uh, I, you know, it's it's enough to have a good cliffhanger. There's enough dialogue and certainly uh, elements here that that make for a good initial story here and as we talked about because this was rooted in the dna of potentially being an on-screen piece there's a lot of really interesting and fun imagery and uh, of course uh ty templeton uh he's he's like a fine wine his art has only aged mm-hmm. with grace and and beauty as he's gone along here but still looking back at some of this his first uh, official dcau uh work here uh technically i guess uh, actually i don't know if that's i don't know if that's accurate but i'm going to just assume it is because it was in he did some batman adventures too did they okay yeah, all right because there's whatever the issue where he's beaten on gordon with the with the bat that kind of mirrors the death in the film. oh you're right you're right you're, right, you're right definitely ty templeton joker i just Good call. so it that's factually inaccurate you can cut that out <laughs> yes <stop laughs> uh but as far as the yes yeah, as, as far as the actual issue itself it's it's certainly a it's great uh, Ty Templeton's work, which is only, you know, aged like a fine wine is uh, is mm-hmm. fantastic for the issue. Some really bright colors. I really enjoy the way that some of the colors uh, were used to to really get across whatever emotion is happening in the scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of those uh, those panels of Two-Face with his uh, where he's either his anger is escalating or you can tell that he's getting irritated and the color of him, like the, the color is just kind of masked in a, in a reddish hue or in, in other cases, you know, maybe a hint of jealousy. It's a, there's a twinge of green to it, but Mm -hmm. there's a lot of great uh, color usage for the episode also, or for the issue also. So yeah, it's a, it's a great kickoff. I think uh, the cliffhanger is certainly interesting enough to have us coming back for more uh, for, for the next issue and would certainly, if this was my first time reading it, which was the first time reading it in a long time, uh, yeah. but not my first time ever, obviously I, I would say it would be enough to say, yeah, I'll, I'll pick up issue two. There's enough here. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a yeah. I think this is a, a really fun first issue. Um, I think it is a little bit of a swing to do your to do a, a cliffhanger in your first issue, especially in this era of a of a comic book that's more maybe directed directly at, at kids at the time. But mm-hmm. it's it's exciting. Um, yeah, the the art again. Uh, Ty Templeton, as you mentioned, on pencils. Rick Burchett on inks. Linda Medley on colors. Yeah, this this book is so there's just there's just such a life to the art in this book. It's very hard, as we've discussed over the years, to accurately de- describe comic book art a lot of times just mm-hmm. because it's hard to just be like, well, Batman looked cool in that panel. But I think I think he did a good job there exploring the uh, the color identity and how that uh, that adds to the emotion that the characters are feeling. But yeah, I think the the Harley the Harley fight that we get as brief as it is with all the oranges and reds from the uh from the gun and the and the flamethrower and then the hyenas come coming crashing out of the uh the van is a lot of fun even some of just like the landscape like the establishing shots of arkham look great as well um Mm -hmm. so 
Uh, and yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge, I'm always, always loved uh, Ty Templeton's Joker. I think of all the, the tie-in as, you know, as much as I love a, a Mike Parabek or a Rick Burchett or, uh, or, you know, some of the other artists who worked on, on the tie-in books. I don't know anybody that draws joke, this Joker <laughs> yeah. uh, better than, uh, better than Ty Templeton does. So uh, it was, it's a lot of fun having him show up in, in the issue as well. So yeah, and uh, like what are, that that last shot of Two Face towering over here, the doors kicked in. You can see that it's raining in the background. His hair's all kind of wet, and he's dripping, mm-hmm. uh, and he's just towering over here with the two smoking guns in his hand, and she's sort of cowering away from him. I was like, what a final image! Like that's that's a cliffhanger right there. Absolutely. But- And uh, that will sort of be the cliffhanger for us as well, as we will tackle part two next week. Uh, But before we go, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping here. Thank you, everybody, for listening, whether you do so on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Pod Tower YouTube channel, or any other uh, third-party podcast apps. We do appreciate it. A great free way to support us is to, uh, to subscribe to us wherever you are listening. And uh, if it gives you the option, give us five stars, give the videos a like on YouTube and uh, on Apple, you can actually leave us a review in addition to giving us five stars. And if you leave us a review, we will uh, we'll send you a little gift ski if you uh, live within the continental United States. And uh, and in fact, Cal, I believe we have a new review to read out this week on the show. Indeed, we do, Liam. And that is another five star review uh, from Zach Channing, who's one of our biggest supporters and uh, frequently reaches out to us, talks to us uh, about uh, about each episode. So, Zach, shout out to you. Thanks for being a loyal listener and also leaving this amazing five star review. So Zach said five stars. Bravo! Exclamation point. At the time of this review, Cal and Liam have officially reviewed all 85 episodes of Batman the Animated Series. I've listened to every one of these guys, and these guys are the best in the business. Some of the episodes they were hard on surprised me, but I never came away from a review without new thoughts and ideas. A few of their observations flat out blew my mind and made me go back and do my own rewatch. Bravo, guys. Congratulations on this achievement. Uh, Very kind words. As we said, Uh, Zach is a loyal listener, certainly somebody that gives uh, great feedback and is never afraid to share uh, his thoughts about the uh, about about the episodes or the review and gives his own scores on on certain things sometimes, too. So uh, shout out to Zach. Zach, thanks for taking the time to do that. And uh, we will be sending another thank you gift your way. Uh, Zach is a two time reviewer. For the podcast so if you even if you have reviewed the podcast before if you're listening on apple podcast you can go back and leave a second review and guess what you'd be eligible for one of our gift skis if you're here in the continental united states so shout out to zach zach thanks again and thanks for the kind words and thanks to all of our listeners absolutely uh can't yeah can't say a nice uh enough nice things about uh about zach and some of our other listeners who interact with us all the time we always appreciate it especially those as mentioned who take the time i know it takes a minute to get that review up and and everything so the fact that you take the extra time to do that sort of stuff does help out the show tremendously Uh, other ways you could support the show if you'd like to support us more directly uh, you can head to the notes of this very episode the show notes there there will be a link to our store where you can buy yourself a mug or a hat or a t-shirt or something that'll help us out financially there's also a donate button where you can uh, give us a little bit directly we have a few monthly uh people that uh, that donate to us every month we greatly appreciate that it's incredibly generous especially in in this day and age there's a lot of things you can spend your money on and a lot of things uh you know we wouldn't blame you if you'd prefer to spend your money on so the fact that anybody uh, chooses to do that is uh is very humbling to both of us so uh with all that said cal as mentioned, we're doing, uh, we did part one this week. We're coming back for two timer part two next week, Batman and Robin adventures. Number two, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you are listening to this and either have not read this comic or maybe have not read it in a long time, uh, there are a few different ways you can find this. The first, of course, being on the wonderful DC Universe app. <laughs> it is a wonderful application. <laughs> it sure is. Um, and also just recently, it was re-released in the Batman and Robin Adventures Omnibus that came out that I think you can pick up on Amazon. That's a little bit more expensive, 
but mm. uh, there was also some cheaper uh, collected volumes that collect, I think maybe the first 12 issues of this, of, uh, of this particular comic run uh, a couple of years ago as well. You may be able to find those on Amazon or on your, uh, your at your local comic book store. Hey, maybe even be, be able to find the single issues if you prefer it that way. So a couple, couple different ways you can, uh, you could find this comic and, and read this one and, and read ahead to, to issue two before we come back next week. And uh, we can't wait. But until then, I'm Liam. And I'm Cal. And we'll talk to you soon on another episode of the DCAU Review. Bye-bye.